Thank you. Uh, can I request the brothers uh, on this side to move uh, towards the le left of me so that sisters can come forward, inshallah, over here? Yeah, all the brothers to that side. And we have some sisters who can move forward here, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum sisters, can we have some silence inshallah and if you see your children uh, creating disturbance, it will be very appreciated if you can take them to the gym or outside, okay inshallah, jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum sisters. So this space is for you, inshallah. Once the brothers are done praying, you can move forward here, inshallah, okay? Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum everybody. We'll get started inshallah. <clears throat> Whoever is going to be with us, please be with us. Take your time and hurry up inshallah. Whoever needs to go, go in peace. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah, and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. May Allah grant us and you a life upon his path. Say ameen. And a death while adherent to his guidance. Allahumma ameen. And a reunion around him and a drink from his blessed hand on the day of thirst, the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen and an opportunity to see the blessed face of his Lord and ours, Allahumma Ameen. 
Jazakallah khairan once again uh, for the gracious invitation for joining us uh, through the perilous, uh, notorious storms <laughs> of the springs and summers of Carolina. Uh, very courageous of you. I ask Allah to make this gathering uh, something that weighs heavily in your scale of good deeds and remind us all about it on the day where we will surely be in need of every last good deed. Allahumma ameen. So, <clears throat> navigating the many, probably uh, countless challenges of our day and age. As Muslims that value our faith and believe that prosperity in this world and the next can never be attained without this faith. The first thing I want to say very quickly is that, you know, these endless, countless waves of like, Whatever is trending, whatever is popular, ideas, beliefs, lifestyles, worldviews. Every time they crash, you know, at, at the, the, the gates of our heart and our mind, they are not harmless, right? But you'll, not, you'll never be able to stop the waves from crashing against your walls. The only thing you can do is really make sure that your boat or your fortress is bulletproof or waterproof. Yes? To fortify the walls of your fortress. To make sure, you know, the, the hull of your ship is impregnable. This is the most important takeaway from tonight's, inshallah, discussion. I will end with it and spend more time on it than anything else. But I want you also to notice... <clears throat> What usually happens though, when people are presented with these ideologies, these challenges, these beliefs, uh, these temptations, these doubts, these desires, one group of people will just totally try to justify it and say, there's nothing wrong with this Islamically. This is perfectly in line with Islam. Another way to put it is, I can be 100% Muslim and the best kind of Muslim while living my life the same exact way that the majority of wider society lives their life. And that's a little bit problematic, of course, right? Because Islam is universal. Islam does fit for every culture. Islam does leave some flexibility, some room for culture, for urf. But Islam doesn't leave the room for culture. <laughs> you just let culture decide what Islam means, correct? And these cultures are all man-made and they're all imperfect and Islam is perfect, right? That's the problem. And then on the other side, other people, they don't notice sort of the, the upside of these dominant cultures, of these different waves, these trends, these ideologies. They notice what's negative in them and so they reject them altogether. The complete opposite extreme. And they make it feel like Islam is totally incompatible with modern life. Doesn't fit. You gotta be a perfect weirdo in order to preserve your Islam. Right? <laughs> you have to be contrary to what everything wider society accepts to be a true Muslim. And this is not really true either. Because Islam has all of the pros, all of the virtues, all of the benefits of every culture. It does. Cultures have benefit in them, right? Different cultures have different strengths. But they all have some sort of strength, some virtue. No human being really does something for the most part that's absolutely ugly, absolutely evil. You know, even if you think about, you know, even just the gender wars nowadays, when they are promoted, they're promoted with some very beautiful concepts, right? Misapplied in a lot of respects, like the issue of uh, uh, equality. It's a beautiful concept, but we believe in the equality of human beings, right? We don't believe in the equality of human behaviors. Very different. But the point is that the, the slogan is equality. It's a beautiful slogan. The slogan is love. They say love is love, right? Love is a beautiful quality. We're not against love. We're not against equality. That's the idea. So every culture has its virtues, has its strengths, but sometimes they're misapplied. Sometimes they're taken overboard. Sometimes they are perverted and compromised. 
And so Islam, what it offers us is the prose of every culture and every idea and every movement without any of its blind spots, without any of its short-sightedness, without any of its perversion, without any of its misguidance. That was the long philosophical complicated part. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jal said to us, the best words are the words of Allah, right? وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا the statement of your Lord, what he revealed to you, this Quran and this Islam has been perfected. Meaning there is some good out there in the world, but it's all imperfect. It's all incomplete. It's all subject to being lost. But Allah has perfected his statement. The statement of your Lord, صِدْقًا adila, In truth and in justice. Meaning only through the statement of Allah, only through the revelation of Allah, only through the religion of Allah will you find every fact that's provided to be true. Which is very important because the truth will set you free, right? And Adla, only in the religion of Allah will every instruction and every rule be fair. Adla. And similar to that is when the Prophet ﷺ said, Innama bu'ithtu li utammima salih al akhlaq. I was sent for no other reason but to perfect good character. People in general want to be good. And it feels good when we do good. We're, we believe we're good natured as human beings. Right? But how do you complete that? How do you perfect that? It is through the reality and the comprehensiveness of Islam. The challenge in modern times, I know this sounds too simple to be true, but it is the fact that Islam is sort of absent from many of our hearts and minds or barely understood, or barely lived. For so many Muslims all across the globe, Islam is in, uh, to a large extent, this mode of being a cultural identity, not a religious identity. And so what we really need to do to face whatever challenges exist and will exist, is to rebuild the Islam in the hearts and in the minds and in the communities and the societies of the Muslims. You know, there is a statement for uh, the great Turkish reformer, uh, Badi'u Zaman, Sayyid Nursi, Rahimahullah. Anyone know who Nursi is? Who's Nursi? Anybody? Someone knows. Tell me, Sheikhna, quick. Jazakallah khairan. So, Nursi rahimahullah was a Turkish reformer that lived one of the toughest moments in all of Islamic history. He died about 1960. Okay? He lived to see the debacle, the collapse of the Khilafah. Right? When the Muslim Ummah lost for the first time in 1300 years its sort of political entity, its political leadership. It was weak for 300 years before it. We'll come back to that. But it collapsed and the whole world had basically munched up the Muslim world, right? They confederated and they, it was called, you know, uh, it was called the cake of Africa, among other things, right? Everyone got an easy slice, here you go, France gets this and Germany gets that, uh, uh, British gets this and everyone got a piece of the cake. Easy morsels, right? Many of the Muslims, everyone knew we were in trouble at that point. But how do you get out of trouble? <laughs> People had different perspectives. I will come back to this in the end. But the Nursi rahimahullah, he, he kept trying to tell the ummah, don't get distracted from the root cause, the real reason we fell apart, the real reason we were broken and we were dominated and we were conquered, right? And we were devastated. And it's a very Quranic principle, to be honest. And there's no wonder, I haven't read it myself, and it's no wonder why Badi al Zaman, rahimahullah, has like a 5,000 page commentary on the Quran called Rasail al Nur, the, the messages of light, reflections on Allah's book. He was a man that was very close to the Quran. And th this, this is all a build up for you to memorize this rule. Because <laughs> if you don't come out of the lecture with anything but it, I'm happy. He used to say, rahimahullah, Nahnu ila bina il ma'dumi 
أَحْوَجُ مِنَّا إِلَى هَدْمِ الْمَوْجُودِ We as Muslims are far more in need of building what's absent than destroying what's present. The truth of Islam, the beauty of Islam, the relevance of Islam, the commitment, the lifestyle called Islam. Islam is not an event, it's a process, right? We need to rebuild that. We don't need to be overly worried about destroying whatever, fighting off and pushing and offsetting and exposing and all, all the things that have been contrary to Islam or are contrary to Islam in us and around us. And you know, if you think about it, why is this a very Quranic concept? The Prophet وسلم, was rightly credited with producing the best community ever in the history of humanity. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas, right? Best community ever brought out to humanity. How did Allah describe this community? Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna al munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You promote the good and you prevent the evil and you believe in Allah. All throughout the Quran, you find the same pattern, the same order promoting the good, preventing the evil. Do you ever find, especially about the believers, that it prevents the evil and promotes the good? No. It always promotes the good and prevents the evil. You need both. You need both. When you promote the good, it's not lost. It's not forgotten. Yeah? And when you prevent the evil so it doesn't infiltrate, doesn't sort of trespass and displace the good. You need both. But what you need first and what you need most is to promote and push and advance more good than you do, resist and push back and offset the evil. Does that make sense? And I'll tell you, there's actually a very interesting incident that happened at the end of the Prophet's life. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm coming to you. Excellent question. I have to make that case for the next 20, 30 minutes. If I don't, Tell the management not to bring me back. <laughs> At the end of the Prophet Sallallahu life, when Allah Azza wa finally allowed him to return to Mecca, right? And he liberated Mecca. <clears throat> he entered Mecca and the narrations mentioned that he was reciting a certain ayah of the Quran. He was reciting the ayah where Allah Azza wa said, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the truth has arrived, and falsehood has perished. Falsehood is bound to perish. Falsehood meaning is flimsy, it's bound to perish. This ayah is super interesting to me. Why? Because if falsehood is bound to perish, why in the world was it there so long? Like this is like 18 years, 19 years into the Prophet's mission. It hadn't left yet. It took 20 years to leave. So what does it mean the truth has now arrived and falsehood has perished, falsehood is bound to perish? Sisters, help me. What does it mean the truth has arrived? Doesn't mean the Quran has arrived. It's been coming down for 20 years. Doesn't mean the Prophet has arrived. He's been there for 60 years. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, 20 as a Prophet. Then what does it mean the truth has arrived and falsehood has perished? Falsehood is bound to perish. I want a sister to answer. We're equal opportunists here. What do you think? What must it mean? What was different about today? Fath Mecca. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else want to try? Brothers, you can get in on this now. Yes, sir. That sounds conspiratorial. <laughs> but yes, the truth has now arrived in equal force, has arrived on the ground. You see, this wasn't even talking about like spiritual strength here. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ was there, Abu Bakr was there, four or five years into it, Omar is there, right? But when the Muslims, they spread their khayr, and they became the model community and it grew on the ground, tangibly speaking, to becoming a critical mass. When truth became comparable in strength to falsehood, then falsehood can't stick around. Right? 
So falsehood is bound to perish, but the reason it didn't perish is because truth hadn't come yet. But the moment truth is put on an equal playing field with evil, evil's got to go. Is that clear? This is the idea. And so, <clears throat> you know, this is a very uh, agreed upon concept that not even the sheikh has to defend. Like in sports, we say the best defense is a good what? Good offense. Why? Why is the best defense a good offense? I'm going to make the athletically oriented defend me now. Because no matter, I'm sorry, go ahead. But they're saying uh, the best offense is the best defense. <laughs> yeah, because you're not going to beat your team by stopping them from scoring unless you start scoring, right? And the best defense will never be perfect. You know, you can be the best fighter in the world, the best boxer in the world, and the guy, will, your coach will still be screaming, get out of the corner, get out of the corner. Because no matter how good you can block, eventually a punch is going to just slip in. So you don't want to be there. Right? You got to go on the offensive now. In medicine, they follow the same rule. They tell you that prevention is better than what? Than a cure. Why? Because even if you cure someone who's sick from an ailment, it may take a while and there may be leftover damage that's not repairable. Right? And so preventing to begin with is far better than reacting to what already happened and trying to push back against it and see how well we do. It's just a bad strategy. And if I can invoke one more uh, field in management, they say this as well. They say that firefighting is a horrible management <laughs> model. You know, you're always just looking under your feet saying, oh no, we gotta fix this. Oh no, we have to fix that. Oh no, we have to fix this. It's a bad model. Because you're get, eventually something is gonna catch you off guard. And also, you'll never be able to look ahead to prevent things in the future, right? You're too busy working in your business, you'll never get to work on your business. Does this make sense? Or am I just like all over the place? I want you to notice how valuable this rule is, and then we apply it where it's most important. You know, even in the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, what is superior? Alhamdulillah or Subhanallah? Okay, who says SubhanAllah? Raise your hand. Let's be democratic about this. SubhanAllah, raise your hand. Both is not an option. And voting is haram isn't an option either. Alhamdulillah, raise your hand. Okay, the majority is right. I wonder if they know why they're right. So you're right. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, وَخَيْرُ dua Alhamdulillah. The best, the most superior form of supplication you can make is to say, Alhamdulillah. But I want you to appreciate in line with the theme of tonight's discussion, why? Because Alhamdulillah is asserting, is admitting, is like explaining Allah's perfection. Allah is perfect. All, every angle of his description is praiseworthy. All praise be to Allah. Whereas Subhanallah, is roughly translated as glorified is Allah. But what that really means is Allah is glorified above flaws. So Alhamdulillah means Allah is perfect. And, alham and Subhanallah means Allah is not imperfect. They're two sides of the same coin, right? So Allah is eternal. Allah does not die. They're two sides of the same coin. But what is better? Alhamdulillah is superior. Why? Because if you are, I'm sorry, you want to go for it. The scholars have mentioned many reasons. They said, look, basically, if you spend too much time negating flaws, negating imperfections, disqualifying bad qualities, that almost already gives value to the bad qualities, right? It validates them, as they say. That's why the Qur'an, many a times, when it's describing Allah, it tells you so much. The Qur'an is invested so much in showing you how great Allah is. But when it's speaking about what Allah isn't, or these false idols, why they're not Allah, it does it in passing. It does it because they don't deserve the attention. 
A lot of times you'll find phrases like Asma'an Sameitumuha. You guys call them God. These names that you worship. It's as if the Quran is saying, look, you get an onion peel and you call it steak, it's not going to help you. You called it steak. It's not steak. It's just a name that you gave it. Very dismissive. This is so you don't validate that they could possibly be gods and therefore I really have to disqualify them. Make sense? Some scholars gave the example of what? Imagine going to the, a king of this world and in, you know when you're trying to flatter him, trying to praise him, you're basically negating all bad qualities. You say, your highness, you are not a loser and you are not stingy and you are not ugly and you're not that fat and you're not... <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not a garbage man. And you're not this, and you're not... What's going to happen? I didn't say anything wrong. Yeah, the guy's like, uh, he'll give you the extended tour of the dungeon downstairs. That's what's going to happen. Why? Because you negating all of this, you're spending too much time on it as if it could be true. As if it needs to be addressed. It, it adds suspicion. It is said that Umar radiallahu anhu one time gave the, the punishment for slander to a young poet that said in the middle of his poetry, وَمَا أَبَوَيَّ بِزَانِيَيْنِ And my two parents are not adulterers. They're not fornicators. They, they don't commit haram, you know, acts. And so Umar whipped him. And he said, I didn't say anything wrong. I said, they didn't. Why are you whipping me for slander? He said to him, نَفْيُ tuhma fiha إِشْعَارٌ bituhma." You to disqualify this accusation makes it sound like the accusation is believable. Like nobody ever said your parents are fornicators. You come out of the blue and say, by the way, my parents aren't fornicators. That's really suspicious. You made it sound like, you know, it's up for grabs, up for discussion. You know, like if I were to ask my, if I were to ask all of you, imagine like, you know, after the lecture, I stop you all at the door and say, okay guys, Zakallah khair for inviting me to rally and everything, but who stole my shoes? Not funny, who stole my shoes? And one of you out of the blue says, I didn't take them. Wallahi, I didn't take them. It's suspicious, isn't it? You tell your kids who took the cookies from the cupboard and one kid says, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Well, no one said it was you, right? This is the idea. And so the Quran came to tell you, you need to spend more time understanding who Allah is it's far more valuable than understanding who Allah is in subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's do some exercises to speak about some of the many challenges we, youth and adults, face all the time and how we can use this principle of building what's absent, not trying to attack what's present. The challenges, okay? Number one, love of dunya. The love of this world. This is, by the way, this is not a small issue. This is not a small challenge. This is the reason that most people don't realize they're uncomfortable with the faith. It restricts them from access points to dunya. It, right? The biggest lie of modern times, the biggest fraud, is that the purpose of life is happiness, and happiness is found through chasing materialism, dunya, consumerism. You are valued. You will find fulfillment through what you step on, your sneakers, right? The type of sneakers you're wearing. The biggest lie in modern times. So how did Islam teach us to combat the love of dunya? Because it's natural, right? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. Keep in mind, this is not something new. This is not Shinawi strategy. <laughs> this is Quranic. This is in the Sunnah. The scholars have talked about people that messed up in their strategy a thousand years ago or 800 years ago. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, 13th century scholar, he says, and if you find it too difficult to get people to tame their love for this world, grow in them the love of Allah. Because when they love Allah more than they love this world, then it becomes easier on them to resist the urge of this world. He said that is what a knowledgeable person does. He said many of the zuhad, many people that are sort of strong enough to be minimalist with dunya, but they don't have much knowledge, right? They're sort of austere, sim simplistic life. They try to get others to do it. He says they totally mess up. He says they try to get people to hate the dunya. The dunya is cursed and so on. 
by the way, that wording is, is a hadith, but it's mis-explained a lot of times. You know, this world is cursed, stay away from this world. And he says it's very hard to convince someone to hate this world, to destroy the love of dunya in their heart. It's my world, it's my oxygen, it's my sun, it's my earth, it's my friends. It, how? He said, but the person that has knowledge does not try to destroy that. He builds in its place the, a superior love for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The awesomeness of Allah, the majesty of Allah, you know, the graciousness of Allah. So you become indebted to Him and committed to Him through that. That's one application. Another application I want you to think about, and I spoke about this a little bit in the khutbah today, is when you commit sins, one of the most important ways for you to stop a certain sin you're committing is to separate your sins from your good deeds. What do I mean? Many people, they commit a sin, so they say, what's the point of praying? Khalas, I'm, I'm a horrible person. I keep going to this website or going to this friend circle or this, that, and that. And they just stop attending, right? Stop uh, devoting themselves. What you want to do is separate and say, no matter what sins I'm going to commit, I'm going to just commit, <laughs> practice more and more good deeds. Because these good deeds, of course, you want to stop your sins. But one of the greatest ways to stop your sins is to grow the khayr in your life to push it out. Shaytan cares more that you stop good deeds than he cares that you commit sins. Because he knows good deeds are more powerful. Build what's absent. It's more important than destroying what's present, though you need both. Is that clear? Let me give you a, a, a long-winded example now because it's a, it's a major subject. Doubts in Islam. When people have doubts in Islam, when these come crashing at your, at your walls, as we've been saying in that metaphor, how do you fix the doubts? Some people, they try to react to the doubts every time they arise. So they try to sort of treat the doubts retail. I have to have an answer to this question. Now I need an answer to that question. Now I need an answer to this question. But the problem is, that's a bad strategy. That's firefighting. <laughs> that's trying to cure, not prevent. That's, you know, trying to play defense all the time. It's really bad. You know why it's really bad? Because being skeptical, having the mindset of doubt, will never bring you to knowledge. You'll always have something to doubt. You know, I'll share with you a story that even in, in the Western, you know, philosophical tradition, this was recognized by some of the most noteworthy thinkers and skeptics in the Western world. Rene Descartes. Who's Rene Descartes? Anybody know? The guy who established KFC. Correct. No, no, I'm joking, guys. I'm joking. My goodness. I'm a recovering New Yorker. Pray for me. I know my humor is a little bit uh, raw. Rene Descartes, French rationalist. Jazakallah khairan. This man said, the only thing I know is that I can think. And therefore, I don't want to take anything for granted. I have to be certain. So I have to doubt everything until I have proof for it. Make sense? Okay. So as he went on this deep dive of like deconstructing everything, doubting everything, to start from the bottom up, he said, the only thing I know is that I think. I think, therefore I am. That's his famous line. I think, therefore I am. He got stuck. He had a crisis. And even Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, had, had hundreds of years before him had something similar. And he writes about it in Al-Munqid min al-Dalal, being saved from his guidance. But Rene Descartes says, I got stuck and I said to myself, wait a minute. How do I know I'm thinking? <laughs> the only thing I know is that I can think, right? I need to be open-minded. How do I know I'm thinking? How do I know my thinking is not being manipulated by some demons? In modern times, he would say, how do I know I'm not in the matrix, right? How do I know my brain is not plugged up to a jar with wires to it, making me think and imagine that I'm thinking, but I don't, I'm not really thinking. See the problem? And what did he conclude? <laughs> he concluded that God, he said this, God is not a deceiver. Notice, he's removing God from the equation. God has to be there. Because he is the only one that can explain that I exist and that I have a mind. And without that foundation, there's no point in even trying to use my mind. You get it? 
So you can't continue doubting forever. That is the idea. When you have doubts, when doubts come to your mind, there is a reason why the Prophet ﷺ said, فَلْيَنْتَهِ Interrupt yourself. Because some doubts, <clears throat> you may not live long enough to get the answer for. There's a perfectly good answer for, but you may not live long enough to, to hear it or understand it. Right? And some doubts don't have answers among human beings at all. The answer is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some doubts, sadly, are not even doubts to begin with. And you may not ever come across that realization. So like youth come to me and say, you know, how do we even know that truth exists? My, I remember the first time my, my philosophy professor said to us, that's what's wrong with you religious people. You think there's such thing as truth out there, like absolute truth. But you have your truth and they have their truth and everyone has their truth. There's no such thing as absolute, a universal truth. And a lot of youth get, get like rattled by it. Say, oh snap, that's, that's deep. That's profound. It is profound for about 3.5 seconds. So you think about it a little bit more. And when someone tells you there's no such thing as truth, what are you supposed to say? Come on. Is this statement true? Because if there's no such thing as truth, you shouldn't be trying to convince me of anything, including the absence of truth. Is that clear? Because what you're truly, tr really doing here, Mr. You know, haughty professor, is you're saying the truth is there's no such thing as truth, right? And so we are actually incapable, the way Allah created us, we're incapable of denying truth. We can be all argumentative and like fancy and acrobatic and stuff, but we wouldn't be able to have conversations unless we believed all of us deep down inside there are truths. Okay? Or here are some other questions. Youth sometimes get, you know, uh, sort of unnerved by questions like, if God is so powerful, I'm sorry to keep bringing this stuff up, but it's, it's, I think it's helpful as part of our exercise. Uh, if God is so powerful, can he create a God as powerful as himself? Someone's like, oh, snap, it's true. Because if he can't, then he's not all powerful. Right? They get lost in this mix sometimes. But the question itself doesn't deserve an answer because it's not a question. Because it's, it's a wrong question. You're saying, can God create someone as powerful as his, himself, right? But God is not created. What do you mean create someone? That someone would be created. God is not created. The question is wrong, right? Someone, someone said, uh, can God create a, uh, a circle with four corners? If he can't, then he's not uh, God, right? <laughs> well, hold on. You need to define do you want a square or a circle? You're, you need to tell me what you want before we ask God for this that you're arrogantly demanding, right? And there's so many, so many examples of this. You know, can, can God, uh, I'm sorry, last one. They say, can God uh, create a rock so big that even he can't carry? It's just pure arrogance. Just, but a rock is an object. An object has length, has width, has depth. It's a finite object. It has limitations. You're saying something that's infinite, but that's not a rock. Rocks are not infinite. Tell me what you're looking for, so then we can proceed in our conversation, right? And so this sort of like fanciful language can totally, under, if you give into it, that's why you cannot be looking for answers for every last doubt. That's not the process. This retail approach doesn't work. So what do we do? You go on the offensive and you say, how do I build my yaqeen, build my certainty? That is, why do I think Islam is right? Why do I believe the Quran beyond the shadow of a doubt? No blind faith, no wishful thinking. For perfectly good reasons, I believe the Quran is from Allah. Why? I believe the Prophet ﷺ is the true Prophet of God, undeniable. No honest person can know him and think otherwise. Why do I believe that? Once you have that certainty, then these doubts come and they go. They will not rattle you anymore in your faith. You know, I'll give you one example of this uh, or two, very quickly. What time are we praying? 10 o'clock. It's already 9.30. Okay. When I was in my first year in college, I attended a class 
for a uh, for a, a Jewish professor. He he, he was anti-Zionist. The Jews hated him too, <laughs> but. He was also anti-religion because he was secular, so he was anti-everything, right? And the Jews and the Muslims and everybody. And so one time, uh, we walk into class and he threw a piece of paper on our desk. It was actually a Xerox copy of a page from Sahih al-Bukhari. This page is the narration of Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu who said when I was compiling the Mus'haf, I could not find the end of Al-Ahzab except you know, I finally found it with Khuzayma. Then when I found it with Khuzayma, I put it in the Mus'haf. And so he was basically telling us, look, your scholars admit that this Quran was sort of like, not there was no sophisticated method of preserving the Quran. You should not rely on the Quran you have today. Think, when I first heard that, when I first read it, I'm not going to lie. It shook me. It's like, whoa, that does sound really weird. Like, how can the whole community not know the the end of Al-Ahzab or, you know, or was it a Tawbah? And so I couldn't sleep. I had to get to the bottom of it. And there was, a, there was a, an easy, very good answer for all of this, but it took me a while to get to it at that point in time. It made me very uncomfortable until I got to the answer, right? That doubt shook me. By the way, just for disclaimers, Zayd ibn Thabit memorized the entire Quran cover to cover. That's why Abu Bakr al-Siddiq picked him among the many Hufad and Qurra to compile the Mus'haf. But Zayd radiallahu anhu, for due diligence, he was not putting anything in there based on his own testimony until he got at least one more witness. And some ayat of some surah came down at the very end of the Prophet's life and they were not taught as widely or as fast or otherwise. That's all. Uh, and so, very easy explanation. Fast forward 20 years, Okay, very different scenario. Someone throws at me a hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah that says <clears throat> that while they were busy and distracted with the death of the Prophet وسلم, and with washing him, a goat snuck into the room of Aisha radiallahu anha and ate a skin, a hide that had Mus'haf written on it. It ate some, basically a page from the Mus'haf if you will, right? I remember reading that and just laughing. Why? Because I was not in a rush to get the answer. I'm just like, I know now the Quran was not preserved on paper or on skin or on bones. That was just one of the tracks of preservation. There is a whole nother independent track. Ayatun bayinatun fi sudur ladina utul ilm Allah said. Clear verses that we've honored people with sacred knowledge by endowing them with these verses in their chest. Right? And so even if every last copy was burned, it doesn't mean the Qur'an is ever lost. Right? And so I remember reading that and saying, ha, I'll figure that out later. It was interesting. First time I ever heard the hadith. But it had a very different effect on me. Why? What's the difference? Because at that later time, there was much more yaqeen inside me about how the Qur'an is from Allah, how the Qur'an has been reliably transmitted to us. We need to know these things. We need to be invested in these things. I'll give you another example that's very beautiful actually from the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Bukhari and Muslim, Aisha, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the hadith, the hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah, by the way, was weak. Turned out later as a weak hadith. But I didn't even need to know it was weak hadith because I knew that the Quran is not dependent on this. So when you have your yaqeen, these doubts, you become confident there's an explanation here, right? It's not what it seems. And I can sleep until I get that explanation. Even if I don't get it till the end of my life, it doesn't change things, right? There's no doubt in Islam itself being true, the Quran itself being true. N no blurriness there. The example of Aisha radiallahu anha in Bukhari and Muslim, she said, we used to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which of us, which of your wives, awaluna luhuqan bik? will catch up with you first, meaning in the hereafter. And so he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Atwalu kunna yada, the one that has the longest arm. She said, Radiallahu Anha, so when the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam died, we used to stick our arms against each other on the wall, measuring against each other, out of eagerness to be reunited with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so when we did that, we 
understood that Sawada, Sawada bint Zam'a radiallahu anha, would die first. Because she was the tallest of them, she had the longest arm, so we understood she would die first. Listen, she says, but then when, they, when Zainab died first, radiallahu anha, we understood that he meant by the longest arm, the one who spends the farthest with her charities. And Zainab was a craftswoman that would make things, manufacture if you will, with her hands and then donate her profits, donate the money, her earnings, which she would make. What did Aisha anha do? She didn't say, we realized that it was Sawada, but then when Zainab died first, we realized that the Prophet was wrong. No, because, why? because they're certain he's the Prophet. And so when Zainab died first, we realized our understanding was wrong. Never is Allah or his messenger wrong. Right? They lived with him day in and day out. Anyone who even hears of a decent amount of his life story will be certain that he's the Prophet of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyway, zoom back out now to our principle that we've been learning tonight. We are more in need of building certainty than dismantling doubts. Is that clear? Move on to da'wah. When you're giving da'wah to non-Muslims, many people, <laughs> they're always getting into these debates online or offline with non-Muslims telling them this verse in the Bible and this, right? Does this even work? It doesn't work. Because when you argue with people, when you debate with people, it gets their defenses up and they're not listening. And the ego is like lurking in these conversations and once it, that's it, it's over. The conversation's over. Like, when was the last time you ever seen in a debate, uh, like someone say, you know what? He's right and I'm wrong and he's more intelligent than me and I let go of my position and I accept his. What is it? Have you guys ever been to the social media comment sections? <laughs> this stuff doesn't exist. Why? Because it's very hard. Very hard, especially after you're, you've, you've admitted your position to now walk it back. And after you've defended your position, it becomes even harder to walk it back. And after you've made friends and enemies based on this position, it becomes even harder to walk it back. Too much at stake. So debating is just a bad strategy. Yes, there's a little bit of room for it sometimes, right? But it's not a great, like, because you know, debating also, there's no scoreboard. Like who knows who Ahmad Didat is, rahimahullah. Whoever doesn't know who Ahmad Didat is, we can't be friends, I'm sorry, just, it's over. Go make tawbah and look up something called YouTube. <laughs> you know, we, we walk out of the Ahmad Didat viewings of like TKO, crushed them, right? You may be surprised to realize that on the other end, you know, the, the bandwagoners of the interlocutor, right? The other person, the Jimmy Swaggerts and the Anish Sharushis, and they all walked out like, yo, he destroyed Didat. It's like a football game without a scoreboard. <laughs> Everyone thinks out saying they won because what's happening here is such a high level discussion that the masses can never really get much out of it. So just debating has very... So instead of attacking the positions of your opponents in your debate, in your da'wah, assert your own positions. You know, Sheikh Kamal al-Makki, he used to have, like tour the world with a, with a nice course he put together called How to Give Shahada in 10 Minutes. It's a very nice course. Uh, it's just a, a nice name. It was, it was catchy. It's not how to give shahada in 10 minutes. He begins, first thing he says in the course is, some shahadas take 10 years, some shahadas have taken me 6 seconds. <laughs> it's just, you know, how to basically cut to the chase, you know, and, and not get lost in your conversations. How to be systematic and methodical. But one of the most beautiful things he said is, people, if someone has sand in their hand, in their palm, right? And you start attacking that sand, what's going to happen? No, no, if you attack the sand that they're carrying, what are they going to do? This must be valuable. He's attacking it, right? As opposed to he's showing you this sand, not much substance, right? And then you pull out your diamonds. What's going to happen now? He's probably going to put his hand behind his back <laughs> and open his hand. <laughs> Drop whatever he's carrying. 
that has a far greater likelihood of making headway, right? And even the Prophet ﷺ would do this. Like, there's a famous, the famous hadith of, uh, of Utsu ibn Rabi'ah. Like, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to him, the, the famous narration, what's, gonna, what's it going to take for you to stop preaching? You want women, we give you women. You want money, we give you money. You want power, are you sick? We'll spend all our money to get you the best doctors. We'll do whatever it takes, just shut down this project. And so, this is extremely offensive, by the way. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ is listening to this. It's humiliating. But he doesn't engage it, right? He doesn't allow it to turn into a back and forth. He listens, 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 listens. Then he says to him, Are you finished yet? Or are you finished? Oh, Abu al-Walid. Abu al-Walid, father of al-Walid. He's even like giving him a, an honorific title. The Arabs, when they want to honor someone, they say father of so-and-so, right? This guy just blasted you and chastised you, right? And shamed you. He wasn't throwing shade, as we say nowadays. He was just like throwing a dumpster. And he said, are you finished? Now hear me out. And he did, ignores everything he's saying. And he begins to recite to him Surah Fussilat. He recites to him about a page and a quarter of Quran. To the point the ayat themselves were so powerful, Utbah jumps up and grabs the Prophet's mouth and tells him, please stop. Can you imagine how that looked to everyone watching? Like even if Utbah, Utbah didn't become Muslim in the end. Utbah is not going to accept, right? Everyone watching here, look how weak Utbah looked. Look at the value of what they heard, right? And so building your case for Islam is so much worthier than you attacking the positions of those who are holding on to other than Islam. And not just in terms of their scripture, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says that one of the most underutilized aspects of Islam in da'wah is uh, like al-i'jaz al-tashri'i. Like the phenomenal sort of code of living that Islam gives us. Like the, the teachings of Islam. If you are just to offer people what Islam, people are in pain, guys. Like the suicide rates are at the highest. I don't know what people are holding on to. The fact that what they're holding on to is that I don't want to go to a void. I don't want to go to emptiness. Give me an alternative. The crime rates, the, the insecurity, the antidepressants, the suicides, the, the broken families, the violence, the alcoholism, the opioid addictions, everything is out there. And it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. It's accelerating further and further. When you present to people the benefits of, a, of an authentic, a true, God-centric lifestyle. That is of the greatest things you can do in terms of da'wah. You know, the, the most recent, yani by Allah's grace, the most recent shahada I, I, I attended, it was like a four-way shahada. I was one of the four. Uh, long story, but the brother was in the masjid with me, and uh, like after Jumu'ah, I'm walking out, and he was just sitting there quietly, and uh, I said to him, are you waiting for me? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for you. He had attended Jumu'ah a few times, young brother. Uh, and he had taken a mushaf from me before, an English translation. And I said to him, so what's up? He goes, I don't know, man. Just a lot of things on my mind. I was like, you're not Muslim yet. Like, I'm joking with him. I told him, like, what's taking you so long? Let's do it, man. Uh, he said, yeah, I don't know. You think so? You think I'm... I'm like, absolutely, you're ready. I'm like, what is it? What's stopping you? And then he said, you know, Islam is strict. And so I sort of took a deep breath to about to explain to him why Islam actually liberates you, doesn't restrict you, and all that stuff. But I, before I could tell him why there's great wisdom in, the, in sort of the, the, the guidelines, he said, and that's exactly what I need in my life. <laughs> he said, because my father destroyed our family for 20 years and counting with his alcoholism. And I know that only Islam's zero tolerance policy on alcohol could ever save me from doing that to my family. And I was like, yeah, subhanAllah. The people that are lied to and doubting Islam because they're told your Islam is so strict and the world is looking for this, right? The world is looking for definitive guidance, structure. And so you explain that to the world. Instead of attacking whatever they're on, present to them what you have. So the idea is we can't just like critique the dominant narrative out there. We have to provide a better narrative, like a counter narrative, a counter culture. We have to show it to people because talk is also cheap. 
Muslims need to start being recognized for their beauty and their excellence and their progress and their manners and their confidence and their strength and their punctuality and all of that. It has to be like visible or else like, I'm sorry, I don't really care what you have to say. Your actions are too loud. I can't hear you as the, as the saying goes. You know, I'll mention something that parents always complain about and I'm making two more points in closing. Parents always talk about like uh, their kids chasing after these weird personalities as their role models. Whatever weird personality you want to talk about, this athlete or this movie star, or this politician. And sometimes like the, the athlete is like Muslim, but like not acting Islamic at all, right? And they say, Sheikh, you know, you just, you guys got to say something and you got to attack these Muslim politicians and these Muslim athletes and, these, right? Uh, you guys know who I'm talking about, right? But, but here's the issue. This is not our kids' fault, I'm sorry that we left that slot in their heart called I need a hero empty. It is not that person that's the problem. If I get rid of them, if I convince your child that this person is not to be looked up to, they're just going to fill it with somebody else, right? And so you build what's absent, right? <laughs> not destroy what's present. You cannot expect people to live without heroes. And don't think that someone can actually know who the Prophet ﷺ is in a way that causes them to, to sort of like fall in love with him. Not just, yes, technically he was this age and then died at this age and he had this number of children. And this is all important, but this is called superficial. Okay, this is very surface layer. It doesn't actually, the numbers of the years and the amount of offspring don't create love in anyone. Okay, like let's be honest with ourselves. Do, do they ha have they been given a reason to love the Prophet Sallallahu to look up to the Sahaba, to understand what's so great about them, and so on and so forth? Build what's absent. Stop worrying about destroying what's present. The last thing I, I want to I say, and this is the one that usually gets me in trouble, the last example that I, I, I can't resist sometimes. So <clears throat> anyone know who Malik ibn Nabi is? Who's Malik ibn Nabi? Go for it. We all think. What do you mean thinker? I had a sheikh that used to say that, by the way. I'm bothered. Uh-huh. Jazakallah khair. Good enough. Barakallah khair. Perfect. So Malik ibn Nabi, rahimahullah, is another one of those Nursi personalities, right? He's trying to, like, lift the ummah up from the mud and... So he has a few terms that he coined that we really need to like spend more time thinking about. One of them, he used to call it al-iflasul hadari, civilizational bankruptcy. Like we as a civilization are bankrupt and that's why nobody wants to associate with us, including sometimes our own, right? So what, what he was driven crazy by, <laughs> I don't mean that uh, literally, but what used to really just kill him was the obsession of Muslims with conspiracy theories, right? Like we live in this glamorous bubble that like we recreated history to make ourselves feel less guilty. You say, you know, the Ummah was doing great. He was recent, 1973 he died, rahimahullah. Uh, until, you know, the imperial powers, the colonial powers, they came, they destroyed the Khilafah in 1914, the cancellation of the Khilafah, and, before that, everything was wonderful. Subhanallah, we just need to rebuild the Khilafah and everything will be fine again. And uh, He goes wrong, 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 wrong. The Ummah was not fine until the Khilafah fell. That was the straw that broke the camel's back or the end of like the, the, the bad movie. The, the, the Khilafah was called the old man of Europe for 300 years before the Khilafah fell. Okay, we were just basically like a, a straw man. We were just a figure that had no weight in the world. It was crumbling consistently throughout that time. He said, that, why? Because we were bankrupt. We were bankrupt. We had nothing to offer ourselves or the rest of the world. He's saying the whole political fallout of the ummah happened because before that we had a moral fallout, right? We were divided. We were divided. We were at each other's throats. We felt like we were God's golden child, like Ben Israel, right? Allah told us we would go, fall into the same mistakes. So we had a moral sort of bankruptcy before that and the reason why we had a moral bankruptcy was because we had a spiritual bankruptcy before that those are the root causes 
that the deen, what I said in the beginning, became more of like a cultural identity, a bragging rights, a lineage issue, then it became really a God-centric taqwa and iman, right? Uh, type of mindset and heart set. And so he's saying the problem is not the colonial powers. Like, uh, this is the second term he coined, was he says, but what we should be thinking about is not the colonial. The outside is always there, the outside pressure. But we were so internally weak. He's saying, what made us colonizable? That's the term. Like right now, he said, oh, it's because of you know, this superpower and that superpower abusing our countries and stuff. Wait a minute, but why don't they abuse China? Because they can't, right? So the colonial powers, they found a landing site, right? They found us vulnerable, and so it was easy pickings. That is the idea. And so I'm, I, I don't want to get carried away on this subject. I, I wish just everyone, you know, this evening to, to just sort of renew the intention about being determined to, to rebuild. Rebuild, figure out, you know, where exactly do I need to rewind to? You know, if I could share with you one final story, and this is like a, a sort of a symbolic story that happened to me, but it happened dozens of times. It happens to all of our mashayikh. A parent brings the child and says, talk to this child for me. So <clears throat> I'll, skip, I'll spare you the details, but I looked at the girl, and then I looked at her father, and he wants me to talk to her about putting hijab on. And so I said to her, do you pray your five? She said, not really. I said, okay. Do you believe God exists? She said, uh, I'm not sure. So I turned to her dad and I said to him, do you want her to pray to a God when she's not sure he's there? We don't want to admit how, fa how far back sometimes you need to rewind, right? I, I, I didn't want to tell the father, do you pray your five? Because maybe that's where she fumbled it. She fumbled her faith because she didn't experience it because you didn't model for her what an experienced conviction looks like. To be at Allah's appointments consistently every single day. That's what it looks like. Salah is Iman. Iman is Salah. Right? And so just be determined. Yes, we can, we can be conversant in like the prevailing paradigms and ideologies of our time and, and being able to critique them and deconstruct them. That's all fine and dandy. But we have to be better at creating the alternative. We can sure curse the darkness as they say all we want, but we need to learn how to sort of light candles. That's what we need to learn how to do. And that is the only thing that will work and everything else is sort of like a sedative. It'll make you feel better for the moment that at least I'm doing something. But if we truly want to see a turn for the better and the snowball effect to happen, inshallah, for us individuals, for families, build what's absent more than not only, but more than you destroy what's present. May Allah Azza wa help us be solution oriented and not allow us to get sort of pulled into these reactionary uh, behaviors. Allahumma ameen and protect us and our loved ones from whatever belief statement or action that would distance us from him uh, and sever us from his pleasure. Allahumma ameen. Shaykh Tfadl. You had a question? For sure, the Arabic language is part of the deen, and there are certain depths to understanding and appreciating the deen that would only be for those who make that investment. So that was my, my preamble. But I would say that <clears throat> you don't need Arabic to love Allah and His Messenger, right? No way, right? Yes, the Quran came down ultimately in Arabic, but it was universal in its message. And its message, if handled with sincerity, will bring you to the foundations of faith, the greatest of them being for sure loving Allah and His Messenger. You know, if you read a translation of the Quran, you will read about Allah's greatness. And it is natural for us to love great things, right? Why do you love the sunset, right? Why do you love winning streaks? Why do you love fancy car? It's just fitrah, to love things that are just impressive, right? And so the most impressive being in existence, right? There is nothing, rather everything beautiful and everything praiseworthy is a reflection of his beauty and his praiseworthiness. He made it possible to exist in the world, right? And so you will read about his greatness and his beauty and you will be in awe of him. 
you will read also about his favors. And it's just natural. Even if you hate someone and they give you gifts, you start liking them. Like, oh man, I wish he didn't give me that gift. I still want to be upset at him <laughs> or her, right? So what about when you read about the gifts of Allah that shower us by day and by night? That is why the favors of Allah are so frequent in the Quran. Because it's natural for you to love those that are generous with you. Generosity breeds that. These things and so many others are not dependent on translation. So let us not say I need to learn Arabic so that I can love Allah Azza wa Jal. No, you pick up a, a translation of the Quran that is mediocre, it'll get you there. With sincerity, with attention, with a little bit of dedication, with frequency and routine. You pick up the most basic seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or you read about his shama'il, his perfect qualities and personality traits, you will not be able to <laughs> not love him. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Sheikh, should we take questions or are we done? It's your call. You're the imam. We should go. If anyone has any questions, I'll hang out after salah for a few minutes. Moms, dads, brothers, sisters, I'm here, inshallah. And also, I'll be here after dhuhr tomorrow, inshallah, uh, from 2 to 5. With the nasiha, I told some of you after Jumu'ah that we were going to talk about positive youth development. Uh, with the nasiha of, of Sheikh Muammar, hafizahullah, I'm actually going to discuss the components of solidifying our faith, how to build a strong believer, right? And how to see Islam as valuable. The three components of that, we'll spend the seminar time doing that, inshallah, azza wa jal, to build on this talk, really. To actually build what we said we should be building. We'll start that off tomorrow after Dhuhr. بارك الله فيكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك الله